rebuilding in 30 years all of the energy infrastructure around us that took 150 years to build, transforming virtually every sector and every country in the world, and doing all of this at a time of enormous economic uncertainty. This is what lies ahead of us as the world seeks to achieve net zero emissions and avoid the worst impacts of climate change. My name is Mekala Krishnan, and I'm a partner at the McKinsey Global Institute, where I lead our research on the net zero transition. I'm here to tell you what this means for the infrastructure sector. I hope to leave you with three main ideas. The first is that enormous change lies ahead, affecting every aspect of how we build, produce, and power our lives. In short, the infrastructure sector. The second is that with this transformation come risks, but also real opportunities for the infrastructure sector. And thirdly, despite all the economic uncertainty facing our world today, there are immediate actions that you can take to prepare for what lies ahead and begin your net zero journey. So let's get started. Let's start by understanding the scale of transformation that lies ahead. And this slide illustrates the scale of the shift that's needed across various energy and land use systems. Everything from how we power our lives on the left to how we build things when we consider industry to where we live when we look at buildings. The bubbles on the chart indicate the contribution that each of these energy and land use systems have to CO2 emissions. Now, of course, we have other greenhouse gases like methane, but let's focus for a moment on CO2. Two things are clear when we look at this chart. Firstly, we see that the vast majority comes from power, industry, mobility, and buildings. This is essentially the infrastructure sector. The second is that if you look at the bubbles on the chart corresponding to these four, four columns, there is no one sector that does not possess at least of some substantially substantial size of bubble. And so what that means is that the net zero transition will not happen until and unless each and every one of these, these systems, these sectors substantially transforms. So now how do we achieve this massive transformation? In one word, the most important thing is capital. We would see massive capital deployment to support this scale of transformation. Today, we spend about $5.7 trillion on the sectors that I've described on the prior page. Now, this is, of course, not all of infrastructure spending, but spending that is specifically related to the types of assets that contribute to emissions, everything from gas power plants to internal combustion engine-based vehicles. During the transition, that spending on these types of assets would rise from that $5.7 trillion today to about $9.2 trillion. That's an increase of $3.5 trillion relative to today's spend every year that we will need on average for the next 30 years. Now, of course, as we look ahead over the next 30 years, economies grow, populations grow, we put in place certain policies or we implement certain policies that governments have already committed to today, there is already going to be some increase in spending that's built in. And we try to account for that. Even accounting for that, that yearly step up of spend on physical assets would be about $1 trillion. So lower than $3.5 trillion, but still substantial. So it's important to remember that we will be deploying capital at substantial scale to support this transition. But it's not just about the magnitude of capital. It's also about the type of capital that we're going to deploy. To do this, um, to, to understand this, our analysis divides these, the assets that we will be spending on into two different categories. The first is what I would call high emissions assets. This is things like coal and gas power plants. A second category is what I call low emissions assets. This is things like renewable power-based power plants or electric vehicles. Today, we spend about 65% of that $5.7 trillion that I described in the previous slide on high emissions assets. In the future, that split would need to be exactly reversed. So it's not just about the scale of capital, it's also about the type of capital. Now, as all of this transformation unfolds, this capital is deployed, every aspect of infrastructure will be affected. Let's look at three examples to understand how. First, consider the power system. The net zero transition will not happen without the participation of the power sector. The power sector today contributes about 30% of overall CO2 emissions. And so it will need to decarbonize if the world is to achieve net zero. But, and perhaps even more importantly, the power sector will also need to grow 
as we replace fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas with electrons to power our lives. And so what all of this means is that there will be a major expansion of the power sector, and the form of that expansion will be in renewable and other low emissions capacity, a huge opportunity for the sector. Hand in hand with all of this will be a phase down of fossil-based power generation. And as we do this, we need to be very careful about how we manage energy availability as well as costs. As the aftermath of the war in Ukraine has shown us, energy really does power our lives. And so without a carefully managed transition, we run the risk of rising energy costs, for example, if we don't carefully balance supply and demand for power. And costs, as well as availability to consumers, needs to be managed. Otherwise, we will lose their support for the energy transition. Next, let's consider another part of the infrastructure sector which has a very different dynamic. Steel and cement together account for about 14% of carbon dioxide emissions. Now, on the one hand, there are actually low-hanging fruit for this sector to, to start their journey on decarbonization. For example, uh, things like reducing energy consumption through efficient heating practices. That's a win-win both to reduce emissions and to lower costs. But these sectors are typically called hard to abate for a reason. We need to continue to innovate on net zero technologies for the decarbonization of these, these sectors. For example, um, how to raise the use of hydrogen in steel production or carbon capture to manage emissions. We also need to find a way to manage costs. Many decarbonization technologies for these sectors actually raise the cost of production, which in turn could reduce the incentives for manufacturers to deploy them. And so we will need continued innovation to drive technologies down the cost curve, but we will also need collaboration with customers as well as policymakers to create pull for new green and potentially more expensive technologies. And then finally, we come to the building sector. This sector accounts for about 6% of overall emissions. The energy we're talking about here is um, the, the energy spent on heating and cooking. Decarbonizing this sector will involve, on the one hand, retrofitting buildings and equipment with low emissions energy sources, things like replacing the oil boiler we have in, in the basements of our homes with heat pumps for heating and, and cooling, um, as well as reducing energy use overall, for example, through things like improved use of insulation. Now, the good news is that many of these technologies exist, and they also come with benefits in terms of reduced operating costs, reduced energy bills in the long run. The challenge, however, is managing the upfront investments that we will need to make to install these new technologies. We need to invest now for these benefits in the future. We also need to find a way to align incentives to execute on these pathways. For example, if we take rental properties, it may be the landlord that makes the upfront investments, but tenants that see the operating cost benefits. So I hope now you have a sense of the dynamic, the different parts of the infrastructure value chain and infrastructure sectors uh, will experience as a result of the net zero transition. But what does all of this mean for stakeholders that participate in infra the infrastructure value chain? What should they do to start their net zero journey? Let's start first by looking at companies. Given the fact that we live in a volatile world with high inflation, rising interest rates, this is a very challenging time for companies in the real economy. And so for the companies in the audience, I ask you to think about the following questions. What are the new capabilities you need to build today to get started on your net zero journey? What are low hanging fruit you can invest in today? Measures that help you both reduce costs and reduce emissions. Where do you want to lean in on some big bets related to innovation and green business building? And how and where are you going to engage with your customers, your investors, your suppliers, and with the public sector on your net zero journey? For the financial institutions in the audience, as we saw, capital will play a crucial role in the transition. And so I ask you, what capabilities do you need to build to measure how your portfolio is, is exposed to risk, for example, disproportionate exposure to sectors that could see declining demand, rising costs, as well as opportunities. Do you understand the magnitude of emissions that you finance? And do you have a glide path to reduce those emissions in a way that engages instead of retreats from the real economy? And do you understand the new opportunities that are created by the net zero transition? And finally, for the public sector stakeholders in the audience, governments have a crucial role to play to create the right incentives, to drive the private sector forward, as well as manage negative impacts of the net zero transition. 
And so I ask you, do you have a holistic net zero strategy that includes not just decarbonization actions, but also thinking in a very real way about how your economy will be affected and thinking about the new opportunities that are created, for example, in sectors like hydrogen? How can you create the right enabling environment for the sectors that need help with innovation, with incentives, with investment? And how do you plan to support those that are negatively affected by the net zero transition? Today, more than 90% of global GDP and many thousands of companies have made net zero commitments. While the war may have raised questions on the exact trajectory by which we look to get to net zero, that end goal of net zero emissions remains unchanged. And so the final question I want to ask you all is, how will you navigate the net zero transition?